Tara Isabella Burton, welcome to Hidden Forces. Thank you so much for having me. I'm delighted to be here. I'm so excited to have you on the show. I told you that uh, I read both of your books and I read them both last week, which was quite a feat. They're not long books, but they're very thoughtful. And together, they're about 600 pages or so, uh, probably a little less because the footnotes, et cetera. But um, it it was uh, it was it was an incredibly good use of my time. Let's put it that way. I love them both. And as I was telling you before we started, there's a lot that you cover in this book that we've tried to cover, not as competently or effectively, I think, on this show. So it's great to have you on to do that. Uh, before we start, I would love if you could tell me a little bit more about you and um, how you got into. I saw that you have a master's, you know, a PhD in theology. How did you? How did you go from? First of all, what made you want to study theology, and what do you even learn when you go to school for that? And then. Did you always know that you wanted to be a writer and to incorporate that into your work? Like, how did that all develop into who you are today? Absolutely. So I, I did almost always want to be a writer uh, of some kind. I, I wanted to be a novelist. Uh, I indeed, I, I am a novelist in, in when I'm wearing the other hat, uh, as it were. But uh, I'd always wanted to study theology because when I was a teenager, I read uh a, a history of the Middle Ages that I now recognize as an adult was like this 19th century history that was probably not the most scholarly, but I didn't know that at the time. I was 13, 14. And there was a line in there that people in the Middle Ages uh, really just saw angels everywhere. The The premise of this book was that the medieval mind uh, mm. perceived the world so phenomenally differently from the modern mind that we could talk about people literally seeing angels, literally seeing demons, having a sense of the world where these things were taken for granted or were as real, as present as grass or fields or cows or what have you. And so I originally wanted to study medieval theology. I thought, I've got to get in on this. I've got to understand how what people believe about God about salvation, about creation, how that affects their overall worldview, um, both consciously and unconsciously. You know, how do you move through space? How do you interact with another human being? How do you exist as a body in the world downstream of these uh, core metaphysical assumptions? Um, so I went off to Oxford to study theology. I, I, I'm American originally, mostly. Uh, and I I went to Oxford in the UK precisely because I wanted a very old school uh, theological education. At the time, the Oxford program really was, it's changed since, but it was really one of the last. You did Greek and Hebrew and Old Testament and New Testament. And it, it wasn't confessional at all. I had uh, everyone from committed Catholics to fervent Dawkins atheists and everyone in between. And Everyone who came in one way usually left another way, uh, ideologically speaking. But I was very much a, what you might call a traditional academic theologian. And I stayed in Oxford for my master's degree and then for my doctorate, specializing in um, the 19th century in theology and literature, and particularly the, the theology of self-creation of the dandy. So mm. I my plan was to be a novelist and to be an academic and stay in Oxford. And then... I, I had success more than I expected uh, during grad school as a journalist, uh, as a travel writer at first, writing about uh, the country of Georgia, where my mother had since moved for work and where I was uh, increasingly more and more of the time, then about the Caucasus more generally, about religion, and suddenly uh, I was a writer. And I realized that what I valued about writing for the public rather than the sort of narrower halls of academia was being able to talk about the things that I were thought were genuinely important in a way that reached the people for whom I thought it was important. So when I was done with my doctorate, I took a job in New York City at, at uh, Vox.com. I always have to specify Vox with the V, not the F, uh, slightly different editorial bent. And I was their first and I believe only uh, religion reporter. And the contrast between those two worlds could not have been stronger. You know, there's something about Oxford, particularly my college, Oriel, um, and later Trinity. These were very small C conservative places. We're thinking port and Latin and very painstaking research where we're talking about centuries in a very slow and methodical way mm. to 
online journalism in New York City in 2017, which was really, I think, the peak of a certain style of online journalism. Trump had just been elected. There was a real sort of like, we're chasing whatever Trump tweets we write about. And for me, that meant whenever mm. Trump treated anything to do with evangelicalism, that was my job. But because of the nature of Vox, a kind of smaller scale operation, I was, as I said, the only religion reporter. And because of the kind of things that their readers were interested in, I ended up studying and covering a lot of stories that weren't um, obviously religious stories, which is hexing Trump or, you know, Harry Potter fans protesting gun violence using the rhetoric of Harry Potter or yoga or sage cleansing or what have you. And sure, there was a part of it where like that was the gig and that th these were stories that played well on social media, et cetera. And that, OK, that was my job. But I became more and more interested um, in what all this meant and how my academic background might give me insight to something that was going on, which was more interesting to me than just, well, some people like to dress up in ceremonial robes and carry broomsticks, which is this interest in there's actually something to this. There's something going on here in the so-called secular world where more and more people are religiously unaffiliated, to use the kind of polling term about quarter of Americans and 36% of millennials and younger. There's These people are not secular. They're not non-religious. What we're actually seeing, and this was the argument of my first nonfiction book, Strange Rights, is a kind of reimagining, even a remixing of religion where mm. we're all making our own religions, or more and more of us are making our own religions. Both those of us, the 20% of Americans who say we're spiritual but not religious, but also those of us who might tick a box on a form and say, sure, I'm Christian, sure, I'm Jewish, sure, I'm Muslim, but whose actual practices and beliefs are, beliefs are much, much more eclectic and much more diffuse. And increasingly in Strange Rights and later in my second book, Self Made, I became more and more interested in how internet culture and the kind of version of modernity that sort of preceded and is made all the more prevalent by internet culture has created a kind of divinization of desire. The sense that what we want, what we feel, our access to our inner selves, all of these things are constitutive of our truest self. They are the core to who we really are and that they are authoritative. They tell us what we ought to do to be in harmony with our own desires, to do what serves us, to use a, a very popular like contemporary phrase, this is kind of our quote unquote obligation to lead our quote unquote best life. And what I want to argue or have been arguing in both in Strange Rights and in Self Made and in my forthcoming projects I'm not sure I'm allowed to talk about yet is how the kind of spiritual and metaphysical assumptions of loosely described modernity have basically coalesced into an implicit civil religion, one that we don't find in churches or cathedrals, but which we find kind of in the miasma of cultural life, in the subtext of advertisements on the subway selling us uh, dating apps or scented candles, in uh, assumptions made in in news stories or listicles that are just um, thrown out there as obvious. You do you. Be your best self. Uh, do what serves you. Let go of toxic negativity. Don't be repressed in this very particular way. These are these are unspoken assumptions that I think govern a new way of life in tandem with uh, and sometimes instead of traditional religious values and practices. And so I'm exploring that in a, a few different ways, historically and sociologically. Wonderful introduction. Yes, I did not explicitly mention that the that there that the books were str uh, strange rights and self made, and that self made hasn't even published yet. Uh, that comes out, I believe, at the end of June. Am I That's right? That's right, June twenty seventh in the U S. from Public Affairs, and June twenty ninth in the U K. from Scepter. So I'm guessing the book you mentioned at the beginning was William Manchester is a World Lit Only by Fire, because I was also uh, told to read that book as a 14 year old. And I never quite understood the uh, scholarly backlash, not because I 
I tried to understand it. I always heard that whenever you mention William Manchester's A World Lit Only by Fire, which had made such an impression on me that you should be, you should just put a caveat that yes, there's also a lot of controversy around his um his opinions in that book. What exactly got him into such hot water with what he wrote about? Uh, so the book actually that I was referring to was, uh, I think it's Johann Huizinga's uh, The Waning of the Middle Ages. Uh, okay. So I'm, but I'm very interested now that that there was a kind of perhaps a school of thought, and I'm, I'm curious to know more about this, that there is sort of multiple accounts of this kind of uh, fetishization of the medieval mind. Well, it kind of also makes sense. He has a, I mean, Manchester has this brilliant quote at the very beginning of the book that I can't remember now, where where he talks about the medieval mind, um, the superstitious mind that saw werewolves at the edge of the forest and fairies and unicorns. And what I, perhaps the reason why there's so much contra, controversy around this period is because of how little was written down, um, the the low rates of literacy, you know, and and stuff like that. So I mean, that anyway, I don't know. That's a, that's a whole nother topic. Um, so one of the things I was thinking about when I was preparing for this conversation was how to kind of try and structure it as best as possible. Um, not that we have to stick to a structure, but because you've written Strange Rights and Self-Made and there's all these like common touch points between the two. So actually, that, that's maybe a, an important question to ask before we delve into strange rights, because that's how I've thought about sort of going about it. And most of what you talked about right now was strange rights. And we'll get into self-made maybe in the second hour. How much of what you wrote about in self-made derived from what you studied and researched while you were or in, in anticipation of writing or while you were writing strange rights? About half, which is to say that the other half actually came from my doctoral thesis. So originally, when I was an academic uh, or a proto-academic, my doctoral thesis was about 19th century French dandyism and decadence, uh, Joris Crohismont, author of Against Nature, Barbie d'Orphelie, these other sort of 19th century French writers who were obsessed with artistic creation, both of the self and of one's life, as a kind of response to alienated modernity and me to, to sort of steal from Walter Benjamin a bit, mechanical reproduction. The idea mm. that self-creation and dandyism to make the self as a work of art was a theological act, or it was an act with theological weight that involved both a, a search for transcendence in an era that did not seem transcendent, and also a claim of the personal power, the right of of being the source of that transcendence, a kind of self worship, mm. and I I was interested in that from a variety of angles. I was one of those like theater kids who was really into Oscar Wilde. Um, so so I I think I came at it as someone who thought these guys were all great, and then perhaps with a, a more critical scholarly hat on, <laughs> came to a more nuanced view. But the historical part of um what is self-creation? What does it mean? And what does it mean theologically? And I don't just ex mean here, what does this mean for the specific Christian theological confessional tradition, but also what does it mean about the metaphysical assumptions that underpin our shared cultural life? Um, this was a great source of interest to me. When I started working on Strange Rights, my my first nonfiction book, which is a much more sociological book, it's a look at the spiritual but not religious and the contemporary religious landscape and wellness and fandom and modern witchcraft and techno utopianism and social justice, all in the kind of the the, the great religious tendencies of the internet. I I was that book was more descriptive, I would say. But I became more interested in how the internet, internet culture, and this, in my view, quite seismic shift in how we understand our, how we understand ourselves, one another, and one relation and our relationship to text and creation. Um, the questions of self creation seemed even more pertinent. It was mm. one thing to be really into Oscar Wilde as a kind of one off, as it were, and it's another thing to be interested in Oscar Wilde in an era where everybody's got an OnlyFans, say. Mm. Um, and I'm obviously uh, exaggerating a bit here, but um, I think the self-creation now more than ever has been 
democratized and in being democratized has become a kind of obligation um we all have to create a personal brand to uh if if, if we have any kind of career or life that either involves the internet or involves uh, our personalities or our bodies being monetized in some way, or we're planning to go on a dating app to find a partner as, as the vast majority of us now do, selling ourselves is something that we are all expected to do now mm. in the internet age in dialogue with the attention economy. And so yeah. uh, self-made became a kind of historical look at the trends that brought us to the point of the internet age and argue, I think, that the internet has sort of put things into overdrive, but that the impulses, the cultural impulses towards new views of authenticity, cr self-creation, self-curation, that these, these are not new, but rather culminations of wider trends. Yeah, I cannot wait to get to that part of the conversation because that is also a phenomenal book. For anyone who heard the term dandy or dandies, and they only the only other time they've heard that is in the context of Yankee Doodle Dandy, I promise we'll explain what it is and how it relates to Oscar Wilde. But before we do, let's uh, let's begin with um, Strange Rights. And let's mm -hmm. begin with the beginning of that book, which is situated uh, in a scene at the McKittrick Hotel. What made you choose that place? and Sleep No More and the crowds that gather around the bar to tell the story that unfolds in the course of that book. So um, I myself was a Sleep No More fan. If, if I ever, if I was in fact, as an adult into any fandom, it was, just it might've been that one. Tell people, tell people what that is. And also if you can speak uh, more directly into the microphone, Tara, sure. that'd be great. So Sleep No More uh, is a sort of interactive, sort of promenade theater piece in New York City. It now has uh, one in Shanghai as well and a, a similar production by the same team in, in London. But basically, it's the story of Macbeth match, mashed up with a little Hitchcock. It's a giant warehouse where you can wander the space silently and masked and follow the characters that interest you and maybe get a one-on-one -on -one private scene or private encounter with them. So it's like playing a video game in a theatrical setting and it's it, different performers play different roles every night and you could come every night and see something different because it's so so huge mm. you can have different interactions with different performers on the different nights so in about 2012 when i was working on my doctorate and going back and forth between new york city where i was from where i had family and oxford where i was studying i got very involved in this community and this fandom i loved this i thought this was the coolest thing ever i could go to the space that was set apart from normal life that felt kind of enchanted where everything was meaningful i could commune with other people who were going all the time and also experiencing this kind of transcendent we're not in the real world we're in this better version of the real world sensation and that had a huge impact on me and actually on how I, I thought about the things that I was missing in my life or hungering for. At the time, I was I was not particularly a practicing Christian, although I, you know, had grown up sort of Episcopalian. I probably would have put that on the form, but I was not a, mm. a practicing religious person. Christmas and Easter? Sure. Pretty much? Sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah Christmas and Easter. <laughs> and... Something that really moved me was the sense that this this kind of co-creation where we were experiencing something that was itself pointing to the transcendent, but also involved a large amount of personal freedom. It was choose your own adventure in a way that mm. traditional proscenium theater is not. Uh, it did not. It, 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 you are not a collective audience member. In fact, you are not having the same experience as any other audience member. It's purely, as it were, bespoke. And I, this was the genesis of a lot of how I've been thinking about modern consumer culture. And I say this as someone who still has a great deal of love for the show, who will still go to these parties on occasion because I have friends who go and I like them and who doesn't love a good party. But the fact of these these events came to to, for, to me to be very symbolic of... A broader shift that I think is perhaps even more in evidence now than it was when I was working on Strange Rights, which would have been in, in 2017, 18, and the 19. And that is 
the fact, the the experience, the consumable experience as being its own thing, its own category, separate from seeing art. And if you take a look at the whatever the modern equivalent of the yellow pages is, or Time Out New York for New York, uh, an events listing. I think what's striking is how common and trendy the kind of the experience is as a kind of like you go and you have an experience and it's immersive, whatever that means. And your your food and your entertainment are kind of aesthetically aligned in some way and there's a lot of social media opportunity you're doing something that's kind of highly visual where you can photograph yourself and that this is the kind of base entertainment option that is far trendier than just like going to a play or going to the opera and I think what that says about us and I'm, I'm thinking now not just about like something like Sleep No More which I think is actually does have quite a lot of artistic merit but also like the Bridgerton experience these sort of like tie and balls where you dress up and take pictures of yourself looking kind of Regency or um, there was a New York Times article about naked dinner parties where you know the event was that you go to this dinner party naked and you meet others and these kind of sensational sounds like a fun party <laughs> I mean <laughs> Getting naked with strangers it sounds like my nightmare. Um, <laughs> but I think that there is something to this distinct notion that what we want are these kind of transcendent or potentially transcendent experiences that also um, demand of us do not just do not demand our attention in a passive way, but encourage us to be co-creators. We all kind of want to be mm. the main character in our own little video game. I'm also thinking of escape rooms here as another mm. example. Like mm. we are less and less inclined to be passive. And even that, I don't know how I feel about that language because that I, I think passivity can be a good thing. Being, being uh, forced to attend to something outside of yourself is a very good thing. And I think that it says something about our uh, internet saturated culture that we are very uncomfortable with that kind of passivity or that kind of receptivity that what we're more encouraged to want what is more trendy to want is a kind of like I want to be someone else for a little while make certain decisions have certain kind of intimate encounters to have something be all for me and it's very difficult to look at the proliferation of internet culture the ways in which algorithms reinforce that which we like and want to pay attention to by showing us more of the same the ways in which our the landscapes of the reality in which we spend most of our days particularly post-pandemic that all of this is priming us to think a different way about action and receptivity that is so not the same as I think sometimes you'll hear people talk about the internet as being like, we're returning to something pre-modern, oral tradition. Mm. There's, you know, things aren't static. And at that part is true. But at the same time, we're also inheriting from what you could call the liberal or the Protestant or the modern tradition, the, the sort of exemplified by the, the printed book, say, of having individual and internal and private experiences where we are sort of recepting not communally mm. and i think the seemingly paradoxical relationship of those two things the quote-unquote pre-modern and the quote-unquote modern gives us something new and weird mm. and not well defined or not well understood and that is what all of my work i think all of my nonfiction work is about is what what is this new world that we find ourselves in ideologically, spiritually, culturally? How do we make sense of it? And how do we connect this tendency, which I think is hugely influential at least, to our political life, our economic life, our social life? Like where does it actually manifest itself in our day-to-day -day experiences? I argue quite a lot. Um, so many profound points to uh, reflect on. First of all, I think, you know, one of the things that's so powerful about your analysis is the way in which you situate the individual and this individuated world that we've come to experience that's more tailor-made to us, how you situate that at the center of this larger experience 
this religious experience. And that's something also that, and you made the you kind of, you kind of began to, to allude to it in your response. It gets to this other sort of, I think, um, challenge for people is the is which is the biased way in which we think about what religion is so, a, as opposed to what it actually is so that's also a question or a conversation i want to have with you but i also want to comment on a couple of things i love the reference to video games and to this idea of choosing your own adventure i wonder to what degree these types of experiences actually need to be in the physical world versus in the digital world you have communities like QAnon, for example that engage in some of these aspects, but of course something is lost when you don't have in-person community experience. I'm also struck by what you said about uh, pre-literate oral societies, which of course were more malleable in the way they told stories. Bards would travel all through ancient Greece and tell stories at dinner banquets. But today it's almost like each one of us is a bard and we are participating in the myth-making process. And so it's a more gaseous, malleable version of sort of um, storytelling, collective collective storytelling. So I, I feel like those are all actually threads that we'll continue to pull on throughout the course of the conversation. But what probably makes the most sense to do now is to give people uh, a working definition to the best the best that we possibly can of what religion is, what we mean when we talk about religion, what scholars of religion have to say about this. How do you approach this question of what is a religion? What makes something a religion? So my first answer is that it is pretty much impossible to come up with a definition of religion that most, let alone all religion scholars, will agree with. Uh, Try to kind of define religion by by one category or another, uh, belief in a transcendent God or having a holy book or something. And you're going to not only leave out kind of smaller religious movements, you're probably going to leave out one, at least one of what is often known as the world religions. That's, you know, I think I sometimes I, I like to joke that like religion is a bit like pornography. You know it when you see it. Mm. But in order to have a working definition of what I'm talking about in Strange Rites, I narrow down religion to sort of four components that are helpful to talk about what religion does and that religion is often something that provides us with all of these things. And I'm going to say something about the language I'm even using here in, in just a moment. But generally speaking, what human beings historically have gotten from religion is, first of all, meaning. The answer to the question what is it all for? What is the world created? Is the world created with a purpose? What is out there? Is there a God? Is there energy? Are there spirits? What does it all mean? Mm. Then related to meaning is purpose. Uh, what my personal relationship with meaning is. I, a human being, what am I supposed to do with my life? How do I interact with this meaning? How do I interface with this meaning? How do I achieve salvation? Do I do something right to achieve nirvana or to go to heaven, et cetera, et cetera? Third, community. Uh, how do I interact with other people who share this communal identity? And you know, how do we form a polity around these beliefs. And finally, ritual. What specific and often symbolic actions do I take with or without my community to remind myself or align myself with purpose and meaning? Now, you may have noticed, uh, I certainly noticed checking myself, uh, that there is there's something missing from this account. Uh, and that is also something that is in the the language that I'm using. Provide me with what does religion do for people? Mm. These The definition that I'm working with that I almost kind of have to work with when talking about religion in this way, especially in when we're talking about the modern world, is religion as a kind of satiation Satia uh, satiating of human needs. We mm. are hungry for these things as human beings, and this is how we get them. We are getting our religion nutrients from these sources. Uh, this is like vitamin D packets, etc. cetera. Uh, what I have not mentioned, and what I think is kind of goes unspoken is truth and truth claims, which is to say, is any of this true? 
is are there true things about the world and the nature of reality that one religion or perhaps multiple religions uh, are able to get close to expressing um and that is something very different that does not fit into that mold that is also i don't think something that can be usefully discussed perhaps in a, in a scholarly fashion but i think that what is interesting about our present cultural moment is that in the absence of thing five these truth claims what we risk doing and i think many of us have done is thinking about religion as a kind of whether it's a one-stop shop or a one from column a one from column b proposition the thing that religion does is the sate the sating of our personal needs and hungers which it may well do uh or maybe may not do but we think we are less inclined to think like is are these practices true is this really the body and the mm. blood of christ and increasingly as these truth claims have to many people uh, though certainly not all, seemed unsustainable in some way, intellectually, um, scientifically, that these components of religion, meaning purpose, community, and ritual, that more and more people, both among the quarter of Americans who are spiritual but not religious, or sorry, who are religiously unaffiliated, the 20% who are spiritual but not religious, um, these are, are components of life where we can fill in the gaps we can say well i i get my community from here and my meaning from here and my purpose from here and these are the rituals i do and i've kind of cobbled it all together for myself and maybe that is indeed a source of satisfying hunger but it doesn't tell us very much about the world as it is it tells us about religion as a kind of perhaps even a psychological necessity and that's a tension that i think particularly in the modern world we have not really sufficiently mm. addressed so not to get off track but i was actually going to ask you uh in the early part of our conversation where you mentioned your forthcoming work if your forthcoming work was actually going to be about the subject of reality and reality distortion that we're experiencing today because what you just touched on, this sort of this idea of ontological truth and whether or not religion can tell us something about that is for me a very interesting question. So is that your next book? Or uh, can you blink twice if <laughs> blink twice if it is? In part, yes. Okay, so I great. can't give any details until everything is publicly announced. But my next book deals more explicitly with the internet and with both reality itself and reality uh, as something that we culturally perceive as being fungible or malleable mm. or downstream of human ingenuity. And uh, deals, I'll just, a uh, little teaser, it deals a lot with occultism and magic and 19th century notions of romanticism and nationalism and the kind of great 19th century cultural stew that gave us a sense that reality is something that human ingenuity can shape perhaps even through a kind oh, of spiritual I magic. Oh, I so, love it. I mean, you're now you're touching also on some on some things that you touched on in the book, like extropians. And there's an interesting thread to follow for me that you didn't really develop in the book and I want to ask you about, but again, I don't want to go on a tangent here, which is the through line between eugenicism or eugenics and extropianism. Um, and if there's one in your view, because it's one that I've sort of followed on my own independently but anyway we'll we'll have a chance to to get into that i also think it's really interesting the way you talk about religion because this is something else that i was thinking about in preparation for this which is that in general terms we everyone that's listening to this conversation today and certainly you and i that are having it are listening to it from the perspective of a modern self right and so even when you the way you talk about religion as fulfilling certain needs i wonder to what extent a medieval mind would have even been in a position to conceptualize religion in that way in terms of what it does for me as opposed to a set of obligations that I have to a higher authority and that I have to serve out the rest of my life unquestionably, unquestioningly, you know? So you pointed to a challenge earlier, which is, of course, that we don't know a lot about the medieval mind, the sources that we have uh, 
are few on the ground and the question of how much one writes one's own, you know, even if we had a di the diary of a medieval peasant somehow, we don't know how well that diary reflects someone's actual actual internal state. So with the great caveat that we don't truly know the mind of well, anyone else, certainly, but particularly the mentality of other ages, that it is extremely likely, like I say this with a high degree of confidence, that we in 2023 are much, much less likely to take seriously or to incorporate and integrate into our sense of self notions of of duty or honor or certain conceptions of our relationship with the social imaginary that depend on the notion that our desires, what we feel deeply to be true, might be A, wrong, B, bad, C, not actually what we really want. Mm. Um, which is not to say that they are any of these things, but that they can be. And I think that I, I something that I appreciate very much from the Christian intellectual tradition, thinking of Augustine here, is, um, you know, I think that there's a, a misconception that, like, Christianity is all about sin, and we say that, like, everything that you want is good, sorry, everything that you, you think is good is bad, and everything that you like is actually terrible for you. And, like, I do not think that is remotely orthodox uh, at all. But I do think that there is a truth that many... Uh, Many, many pre-modern thinkers, but uh, particularly the, the theologians I have in mind here, have wrestled with, which is sometimes we want stuff that's bad for us. Sometimes we really, really want stuff that's bad for mm. us. And that sometimes we think we want something, but we actually, when we get it, don't want it because we wanted something else the whole time. Mm. Like our access to our own internal states is not particularly pure or good what we want is often um and you know someone like Rene Girard is a great example of, of someone who who's writes about this what we want is often downstream of what we see mm. or stories that we're told or narratives that we want to fit ourselves into and sometimes you know we might really really want something truly purely authentically and like either it's not good for us or it's not good for someone else mm. and what I find very true and often troubling about contemporary society is a lack of critical thinking about this question of desire where it becomes very easy, even when someone is launching, I'd say a very weak critique of, of desire to assume that someone is being repressive or oppressive and you know what? For very good reason, I think that there's a long history of particularly Christianity, but but sort of religious traditions being used to marginalize. I'm thinking particularly of queer people, people whose desires were outside the norm. So like this is a completely understandable uh, phenomenon. But I think that we are very unwilling to investigate our access to ourselves. Because we, I think so many of us are so convinced that like, mm. if we could just get maybe, sure, maybe we don't know ourselves, but if through therapy, if through trauma work, if through psychedelics, we get in touch with our truest selves, then all we have to do is follow the innate deep instinct of who we really mm. are. Man, so many things to pull on here. Um I'm going to pivot at the end of this um, quick sort of set of statements to Emil Durkheim, because I want to touch on the the other side of the, um, the the role of religion, because we talked about meaning making. I also want to talk about social coherence. Before we do, I want to pull a quote from Self Made, which I'm not supposed to do right now because we're not supposed to talk about Self Made. I'm just kidding. It's OK. Go but ahead. I, you can talk actually, about my forthcoming book as much as you want. I actually had a had a. Um, I actually wrote out a question for you here because I thought it was incredibly insightful the way you ended this book, Self-Made. And you posed two questions towards the end of the book, and they were as follows. Quote, how can our desires be the truest parts of ourselves when all too often they are shaped by others? And how can we be sure we even know our desires or our motivations or our goals to begin with? So 
not only is this important, and not only has this always been important, even it, it, forget, like, let's just go back to the last hundred years since really the beginning of the proliferation of advertising and consumer culture in the early 20th century, when all sorts of, um, I mean, besides the the fact that we have our own desires and they may be separate from what we want versus what we really want or what, you know, our actualized selves or um, our desired selves. But today we live in a world where experience is increasingly intermediated by corporations and institutions that control that manipulate our desires in order to get us to do increasingly the things that they want to to in most cases to move towards the commercial outcomes that they desire so i think that's an incredibly profound observation and something that i would like to touch on um at, at least in the second hour so i mentioned emil durkheim emil durkheim is of course the famous sociologist and you write about this in the book that one of the ways in which we can conceptualize the purpose of a religion, because it's a lot easier probably to talk about what it's for than what it is, is in its role as a sort of glue that keeps the society together. I, I want to ask you a question about that and fold that into a question about meaning, which it, which sort of builds on what you said earlier. So how are these religions, these new religions that we'll have a chance to get into in this conversation, performing? Uh, on a relative basis to what we consider to be the great religions that we grew up with or that we sort of associate with religion when it comes to social coherence, helping us cohere as a society, helping us live in community, fulfilling those communal needs. And how are they performing when it comes to giving us purpose and meaning? So... Just speak into the microphone for me yeah, when you're ready. Sorry, oh, yeah, I'm just no, it's okay. taking a moment to think. No, I love it, I love it. Um, I think that what these new religions are doing, they are successfully forming a kind of stopgap, which is that they there's like, the, let me rephrase this. I think that today's new religions are doing the kind of job that of sating human need that like a cliff bar would be doing for hunger. Like I think that they are kind of addressing immediate needs in a convenient, quick, cheap and easy fashion, mm. but are not necessarily uh, sufficiently complex or sufficiently intellectually coherent or sufficiently in touch with the necessity for extrinsic moral realism. Um, I think because so many of them in particular don't make real truth claims that at a certain point, what all of the religions that I write about or the proto-religions or whatever you want you want to call them, boil down to is a kind of religion of the self. Um, I think for, for, for various reasons, that's probably actually less true of actually going back a second. In my book, I talk about three contenders to mm. being our, our next civil religion. And uh, this book was written uh, for what it's worth. This book was written in 2019, came out in 2020. And I said, the sort of social justice progressive activism as one kind of stream of awareness, a cohesive ideology, a techno-utopian, like California ideology, libertarianism, and kind of atavistic neo-vitalism, you could call it, like Nietzschean-inspired, mm. Jordan Peterson, like paleo self-improvement, just to give you a sort of rough mood board of the of the camps I was talking about. Now, I would have said at the time that this is actually less true of something that I think the social justice movement particularly has done well is actually combat some, some of these uh, tendencies. I think uh, there are certain kind of moral, communal, collective, and eschatological um, goals and tenets uh, that give a kind of sense of solidarity. But 
speaking to you not in 2019 but in 2023 i would amend my or update the thesis in strange rights and say that actually what we're seeing is kind of elements of all three of them coalescing together under the techno utopian umbrella so what we're actually seeing is that this kind of new civil religion this this frankenstein tendency that is largely techno utopian with fleet like elements of atavistic vitalism and some less elements of certain kinds of so sort of social justice discourse is becoming this this sort of behemoth cultural behemoth to which we all to a greater or lesser degree subscribe not because we've so thought about it and said yes i definitely believe this mm -hmm. but because we're Every time we pick up our smartphone, every time we count our steps, every time we uh, post a picture on Instagram, every time we read an ad in the subway, we're kind of replugging ourselves back into this ideological matrix. And the way that I would describe this this Franken phenomenon of 2023, which I think was sort of intensified by the by the pandemic in many ways, is this sense that. Our personal, experiential, psychological contentedness, uh, which we alone have the power to understand and access, our greatest obligation is to ourselves to be true to ourselves, whatever that means, through recognizing that The oh, actually, I'm gonna take a second and think about how I want to phrase this. Um, through a belief that our non physical manifestations of who we are, uh, whether it's speech, whether it's creativity, our, our kind of like mental powers shape reality far more than anything kind of physical or concrete. It's a faith in human ingenuity. It's a faith in human creativity. It's a faith in a qu sort of quasi-divine human power to create reality. And I, th I think about that, like you can find versions of that in, of course, obvious techno-utopian transhumanism. But I think that like that st uh, strain of thought can also help us understand why someone might say that like language is violence or like words are violence like in a world where reality is downstream of human imagination mm. um that makes perfect sense and is a completely plausible thing like that is indeed true and i don't think that when i talk about this franken phenomenon that like everything in it is is wrong-headed or wrong but i do think that we we are all we are all moral relativists now, and we are all looking to ourselves as the final arbiter of, of morality, of spiritual real reality, of what it means to be human. And more and more of us are willing to see other people as fundamentally inimical to this journey. Yeah, excuse me, I misspoke. Fundamentally. Can, you know what? I'm not gonna be able to even say that word because I'm gonna trip over it a million times. Are fundamentally opposed to this journey. Like other people are obstacles because society is an obstacle. Conventional mm. wisdom is an obstacle. Anything that is settled is an obstacle. I was on um, a cruise this week. I was lecturing on a sort of tech disruptor cruise. And someone from SpaceX was giving a business talk and he said the most important thing that you can do for innovation is like get rid of all safety protocols. Uh, and I'm, I'm obviously exaggerating here, but the idea was that like conventional wisdom is a something that causes smart people with good ideas to get slowed down. And like, sure, that may be the case sometime, but I think increasingly that mindset is constitutive of how more and more of us think. And I don't think you have to be a like Silicon Valley CEO to think that way. You just have to use the products that that they make. Man, you must be in a really like creative phase of your life. <laughs> Sorry, what? 
you must be in a really creative phase of your life. You know, sorry to, I'm just saying it. I, I see what you've been putting out and just talking to you and listening to all the really profound sort of um, threads that you're pulling together. I just think, you know, you just, I, I'm excited to read your next book as well, Tara. So um, not to put you on the spot, not to make you feel uncomfortable, but I think, you know, I think you're really, you're really, you're really tapping into something and you're doing really important work because, you know, those of us who are trying to make sense of this consciously and the millions and millions of people who don't maybe know that they're constantly trying to, to make sense of it, but they are, are really, I think, are, are well served by what you're doing. So I wrote a bunch of different thoughts out here. One is that I love what you say about reality being downstream from culture. Um, I think also this idea of moral relativism is interesting in the context of the world we live in today, where there is this strong sort of progressive um, social social justice, for lack of a better word, woke movement that seeks to apply its moral framework onto the rest of society. And it's also interesting from the standpoint of self-making and this idea that we can be whoever we want to be, how exactly that can be reconciled with a world where you feel that everyone is defined by their, where they fall in the social hierarchy, which is determined by this external um, ideology of white supremacy. So like, well, talk to me just a little bit about that. How, how do you make sense of those things? So what I think is really interesting about the social justice movement, wokeism, whatever, whatever the, the current word for it is, is I think the best of it is a recognition that we live in a culture that is obsessed with freedom and that there's a necessary corrective in saying we are not fully free S much of our identities as it were much of who we are is 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 something we do not choose is given to us and this may be because we are humans and bodies that are mortal and will decay and die and it may be because we were are born into certain uh cultures or bodies that have certain narratives attached to them or or narratives around them into which we are born we are not pure self makers and i think that that element along with the very profound moral hunger for a more solidaristic society form mm. the basis of something that i think is very good very strong and has the capacity to be a useful corrective to a society that far too often now believes in human like idolizes human freedom in hmm. practice however as uh the great frankenstein civil religion for which i have no current name uh sort of gobbles it up I think that it is like a lot of the discourse that we do see in that realm, particularly when it gets turned into kind of corporate speak or mm. ma mandatory company seminars or what have you, is that the kind of moral seriousness of it, of the, the fundamentals potentially gets lost <laughs> and it, and it turns into a, instead a kind of, aestheticization of ju mm. uh, sort of justice as performance the way everything is performance because we all exist in perma performance because we have to be self-creators all the time or a kind of aesthetic interest in the appearance of equality particularly when it comes to personal decision making rather than kind of the quieter slower work of embody change and i think that uh something that is most difficult uh let me put it this way this way uh i was i was recently uh, at my neighborhood's community like a civic association meeting uh i am not a particularly uh organized person i i showed up because they were flyers uh in my neighborhood and i love my neighborhood and i thought i'll show up and uh in many ways it was an extremely like it was frustrating the way all meetings of people are frustrating. Like you have a bunch of people living in, in a neighborhood that is, in, in my case, it's a neighborhood in Brooklyn that has sort of diverse demographics with a lot of uh, different people, different ages, different concerns, all coming together and trying to make something work. And as you might imagine, the like interpersonal drama of like 
speak who gets to speak longest as the meeting it was like an occupy wall to... street it sounds like an occupy wall street oh. board meeting or something it was i mean it was less less that and more like you know <laughs> community board like how are we going to figure out you know who se- who sends the flyers where like we weren't even at that stage mm. just and it was it was not a something that it was not something quote unquote social justice it was not something mm. quote unquote not it was just like your standard garden variety like what are we going to do about the the trucks who pass through the neighborhood but watching different personalities try and navigate like hmm, one person seems to be holding the mic too much and how do we keep everyone on time these very practical things uh do involve being with and engaged with your actual neighbors who you may or may not agree with on everything and you may like may not have the 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 language that is that is ideal um or or access to ways of talking about it that is highly precise but like at the end of the day if you want to not have so many amazon trucks coming through the neighborhood like you're all gonna have to work together and get shit done and i think that one of because a lot of this discourse when it's online it has the benefit of being in these as ironic you know, ironically disembodied spaces these spaces that are not grounded in reality and so the question you can kind of create these narratives of what the the perfect looks like and yet you're not you know and say well like i'm not going to engage with someone if 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 they think this or i'm not going to engage with someone if this is this is how they approach a certain issue and that that kind of idealism is only possible if you're not like showing up and trying to get a very practical small thing done and and I think that, and maybe, and I apologize, we got a, we've gone on a tangent here about the importance of local politics. Uh, but generally speaking, <laughs> I think that like one of the things that we don't do very often, post pandemic particularly, post remote work particularly, is is to, as it were, touch grass to just mm. uh, to just be normal and have to engage with people in like very normal ways and we're all astoundingly bad at it and i'm sure i am too but i think that certain kinds of idealism about the moral promise of social change in communities some like that promise does demand a certain kind of generosity of spirit and a certain kind of productive tolerance that any kind of like internet fueled ideology of 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 perfection is probably going to make harder not easier so and i mean i don't think that was a tangent i think that was very well said um i want to just kind of add some thoughts to what you said and then i'll move us to the second hour mm-hmm. so one i i completely agree with this idea that there is value in knowing how to commune in the world. Mm -hmm. And this kind of brings us to, or touches on some of the stuff that's happened in these quote, extropian or techno utopian societies or movements or subcultures, where there is a strong uh, desire to kind of exit, to exit from the system to, and this brings us back to this idea that society is an encumbrance other people are an encumbrance on my private experience, on my individual experience, because this is what matters. This is where I find meaning inside of me. Um, I don't remember. I forget, I forget where I was going with that. But th- there was another thing that we'll, we'll have a chance to touch on the extropian stuff because I think it's actually very important. Um, and I think it's it's there's a a diseased element to that to that aspect, um, which degrades society and sort of counteracts our capacity to live together because we do need to live in the physical world. It's a lie that we can live in the digital realm because our physical bodies exist in the world. And so there is a relationship very in a very basic informational sense between the digital representation of information and where it resides in the physical universe. So I'm also struck by, in this moment, it's the first time it sort of came to me, which is in all of these different um sort of grand narrative religions that we're looking at here, social justice, techno-utopianism, and and this new activism, this right-wing activism. There's no there's no place there where I've heard the word love. That I'm, to me is pretty profound. I'm actually surprised that it just 
sort of hit me now. And that, maybe that's something to explore too. Um, I'm also, again, I, I think you do such a great job in both of your books speaking to the aesthetic element. I mean, you raised it earlier, aesthetics. I mean, they're everywhere. And of course, aesthetics played a huge role in the rise of European fascism. I went to a lecture like a couple of months before the pandemic where the guy was literally presenting about his work, his like PhD thesis or whatever, on um, fascism and Mussolini and the art of, I think it had something to do with his head. The figure of his head was everywhere. I wish I had paid more attention to that, but that, you know, that, that stuff's also fascinating. So look, I, I, rather than sort of go on and on about all the things that I thought were interesting about what you said, we'll just move it to the second hour, Tara. We'll, we'll continue this conversation about religion and, and the making of the self, because at this point they're so intertwined. For anyone who is new to the program, Hidden Forces is listener supported. We don't accept advertisers or commercial sponsors. The entire show is funded from top to bottom by listeners like you. If you want access to the second hour of today's conversation with Tara, head over to hiddenforces.io and sign up to one of our three content tiers. All subscribers gain access to our premium feed, which you can use to listen to the rest of today's conversation on your mobile device using your favorite podcast app, just like you're listening to this episode right now. Tara, stick around. We're going to move the second hour of our conversation onto the premium feed. 